with a cone on to turn it off. Go on, lads, stop messing. Turn off the sound on them. You can take photographs if you want and take selfies and tweet yourselves, but turn off your volume, please. Thanks. Can everybody hear? No. Uh, tonight is a different kind of a performance for me in that I am not getting uh, some guy to open, some guy to play, some guy to do this, some guy... I, I appear to have completely mistaken the idea of one woman show and thought it was just if it's only one woman then it's cool. But I had about a heap of men. So tonight I actually said no, shall read the brief, do what you're supposed to, be the one woman. So it's a nice kind of paired back night, we're all going to have fun, we're going to get pissed, we have a laugh. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to open with is a piece called The CV. And the backstory to this is, uh, having received the uh, nomination and the, uh, the place in uh, Tronas, Mr. Kiernan, thank you very much for attending, and from Cultivira and from Dylan Thomas and all that yada yada yada, somebody said, do you not realise that you're entitled to a, an Arts Council grant? and that you're entitled to travel and training awards and to funding and to stuff. So I said, no, I had no clue. And so then I looked it up and I found the number and I rang and spoke to some broad called Caroline. And she said, look, I'll send you all the stuff, download it, sort it out from there and everything will be great, so, which I did. And then uh, after spending 14 hours working on it and downloading the form and sending it back, uh, I finally got an answer in email that said that yes, they had received it, and thanks very much, and they sent me a tracking number so I could keep track of the application. And then two days later, I see an Arts Council envelope on the mat, and I went, yay, the cheque, and ran up the hall, and it was a please fuck off letter. So uh, I actually went, yeah, cheers, cheers for that. So uh, then I rang them in, in just a fury and said, really, like 14 hours typing crap? And then you say, no, uh, what's the story? Well, you didn't attach a CV. And I said, really? Yeah, I said, yeah, a CV. And I said, but nothing in my working life would prepare me to receive an Arts Council of Ireland grant for travel and training in Cultivera, in Tranas, in Sweden. In preparation, by the way, for Sweden, I've been watching back-to-back -back episodes of Volander <laughs> and, and uh, saying, hey, hey, and you know, just trying to learn a tiny bit, like, where's the jacks at, and how much is that? So I spoke to a girl called Jennifer at this point, and I said, Jennifer, throw me a freaking bone here. Uh, cut me some slack, do me a solid, tell me how to get the funding. And she said, and I quote, send the CV. <laughs> so I thought, how is anything got to do with the last 30 years of my working life going to get me Arts Council funding? And in a high desperation and in a fury, I typed the following CV. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and while I'm reading this, I would really love you all to remember that this actually went to them. This is the actual CV. This is not a piece I wrote for tonight. This is directly lifted from a sent email. Yeah. Curriculum Vitae. <laughs> I got my first job in 1984. Well, the first one I'm actually going to call a job, because although I had been working for slave wages in the holidays for years, wrapping hot greasy potatoes in white paper, saying salt and vinegar hon in a beach chipper for starving dubs burnt to a crisp, buttering white bread and cutting it into four triangles to leave on the side of a fry on a blue striped plate for farmers before they went to the pub, and boiling a piranha to death, making a stinking seafood chowder in the process when I was in Coleman Doyle's pet shop. <laughs> He moved me to the hardware store after that and I sold paraglow heaters, filled five gallon tanks of stinking paraffin for Mrs. Hayes, rooted in filing cabinets of nuts and bolts for soft tapping screws, while the men in dungarees with the pencils behind their ears laughed and called me Sally O'Brien. I was still working sporadically in the hardware shop but had not been rostered to help out with the live animals due to my previous I was allowed to advise unsuspecting customers about the benefits of eggshell versus silk emulsion, even though I had barely a clue myself. I was bored to death of the whole thing anyway and wanted a change. I wrote a fawning letter to a gynaecologist asking him did he need anybody to be his PA receptionist 
as I could type and answer phones and was good with people and babies. He wrote a charming letter back explaining he did not need anybody and wishing me well and hoped I could find something suitable in the near future. I wrote him an even more charming letter back, heaping him with praise and thanks and wishing every seed and breed of him all the best for now and evermore and calling down blessings on his curly head. <laughs> he gave me the job. <laughs> This was to be in his new clinic, referred to as the rooms across the road from my home. The most onerous task I had in my new employ was having to brasso the plaque that said M-R-C-O-G-F-R-C-S-I <laughs> and remembering to put the bin out on Monday nights. He saw patients from all over the southeast who drove to see him because of his reputation and bedside manner. I became the face at the door and the voice on the phone trilling, good afternoon, and asking women if they were pregnant or not. Would your appointment be for antenatal or gyne? Ah. Are you pregnant or not? I had a legendary memory for names and faces and would greet each patient by their first name and remember which baby they were on or which treatment if they were not. I wrote up bloods and smears and took semen samples in pill bottles wrapped in hankies from mortified men who were undergoing fertility checks. I filed like my life depended on it and knew exactly where to put my hand on anything that was needed and went beyond the phone to the labor ward booking a patient in before he opened the door to give me the nod. We became part of a well-oiled double act, him doing all the life or death stuff while I remembered the more mundane things like his home phone number. <laughs> I got the backstory of every person who ever presented and spent the mornings dancing around the hallways with the radio blaring, straightening the magazines in the waiting room, singing at full throat into the sweeping brush, and calling people from the phone which was supposed to be incoming calls only. One day while I was smoking the butt of a cigar from an ashtray and harmonizing at top volume with the radio, his tiny wife came in and caught me. This was not to be the first or the last time that she would chance upon me doing something not destined to be performed in a workplace, and I can almost imagine the involuntary shudder as she parked her tiny car outside. I was shuddering inside, having chanced upon photographs of surgery where a pensioner had had cysts the size of a small child removed from her ovary. I also read every single chart and all the letters back and forth between specialists and surgeons and every note on every file until I felt I was now an actual gynecologist. <laughs> <coughs> My duties did not include making all those calls, dancing around the roads, singing full throat into the sweeping brush with Chrissy Hind bla blasting on the radio and smoking the butt of any cigar off a saucer when the aforementioned gynae left it in his office and getting caught every time. From there I moved to Germany with a London chef I had become engaged to by accident. I was merely trying to finally hear the punchline of a joke he had told me in the Cedars in Ross Lair the month before. Make Brown was shouting so I had to leg it. I was in Stuttgart the same time as Joxer and so had to contend with an influx of demented paddies into my city all looking for porter and crack and tickets to the game in Necker Stadium, which were scarcer than chicken's teeth. Between Gatch and around with them, I was gainfully employed as a chambermaid in the Intercity Hotel at the Hauptbahnhof, and then translated the London chef's interview, and then they realized I could speak German and became the receptionist in the Park Hotel in Villastrasse. It all went downhill from there. <laughs> Between arguing and drinking with the stranger I was now living with, who spent time picking up the ring from wherever it had been flung on a nightly basis, <laughs> I got a job as an au pair to a five-month-old baby with a couple of Cameroon doctors. She interviewed me sitting naked on the toilet, <laughs> breastfeeding the aforementioned infant. I gave up after Ireland beat England 1-0 and flew home, leaving your man behind. Back in Ireland, I prevailed upon Foss to put me on a course in the teeth of a biting recession. It was 1988, and people queued at night to get the papers early to read the situations vacant and the two lect columns. They queued by day down the hill to the misty quayside to get their dole, joining one of two lengthy snaking trails that nobody ever knew which was the right one, the signing on or the paying out. Is it the signing on? Is this the big oh, no. Shit. The Start Your Own Business course prepared me to surrender to the, to the tearful reconciliation with the London chef when he rocked up at the door with long hair and a sad face, 
and following a successful interview in Dublin, flew to Gatwick and started training to be pub landlords under a despotic maniac blonde in an establishment called the Duke of Wellington in East Horsley. She existed entirely in a procession of pastel pink silk shirts, carefully toned curls, a dunhill in a holder, while she barked orders at the poor Irish crather and the Bristolian Brian, a tiny chef who was so stoned he could barely discern what he was putting in the curry, which was always beautiful anyway, despite his best attempts at self-sabotage. When we qualified, we travelled the length and breadth of England and Wales, running pubs, the largest of 300-seater carvery in the New Forest at Bewley, run by an ex-SAS officer who called everybody pigs, and the smallest, a tiny lock-up in Trowbridge, Wiltshire, which had Delamitri and an Irish alcoholic named Declan as its only customers. <laughs> in every town in the world, there is an Irish alcoholic named Declan, sitting on a high stool, reading the racing paper, eating pistachios out of a machine, clogging up the ashtray with shells and talking pure and utter shite. <laughs> In the grill and in Neath, I was casually dry, carving a dried up hunk of roast beef when screaming Lord Such and his entourage breezed in. He, resplendent in a top hat and tails, and took over the pub for his electioneering, contesting the Neath by election as a representative of the monster raving loony party. They set up their PA by the fireplace where Bonnie Tyler Starr was playing dominoes with another Welsh speaking pensioner and started belting out what was to be the first of many, many impromptu fundraising gigs. I put a chalk menu board outside saying free beer and naked dancer at 10 o'clock, and the punters nearly tore the pub and me asunder when the boys came on. <laughs> the cleaner would come trilling in the door at Sparrow Fart saying, let's put the cake along Lev and get a few pasties from Greg's. <laughs> it was only a matter of time before the media heard about the madman and the mad woman in the pub where the landlady was so small and was asked by Draymond who the gaffer was to be told, you're looking at that. And so I was filmed by S4C News and rang my dad to tell him to turn on the Welsh after tea. <laughs> what in the name of God is she up to now? He queried in mortification. By the time we had done about 40 takes with the meat, it was looking decidedly the worse for wear and the crusty heel resembled the sole of a boot. I had to resort to listlessly turning it over and over with the giant fork as it was too small to cut. I attended the count under the watchful eye of the media and cameras as his common law wife, Anna May Such, in a black cape, wearing a laminate that said as much as such. His actual common law wife, Anna May Such, was present herself, but she went as somebody else. Peter Hayne won. When I couldn't stick your man any longer, I drove away from the pub in Wales without leaving the recipe for ice and moved to London with a steward from the Conservative Club around the corner and moved into the attic of a West End hostelry called the Dolphin Tavern, where I had to clean the gaff, dodge the pair of chocolate Rottweilers who patrol the stairs as security, nix in the Saddler's Wells box office, as well as cook lunches in a pub across the road called The Sun, Oh, dear, sorry, sorry. And nightly served the parade of drag queens and actors like Albert Finney and Rula Lenska, gin and tonics and trays of pie and chips. Dennis Waterman always tried to conveniently forget to pay for the plates of salad sandwiches. Can I just remind you at this stage that this is a CV? <laughs> To the Arts Council? Okay. <laughs> After I moved back to Ireland, I worked as a chef, waitress, barmaid, pub manager, tourist information officer, office staff, medical secretary, school secretary, front of house, back of house, HR, PR, event management, music, film production, band management, hotel, hostel manager, stewardess on an Irish ferry ship, arts centre staff, restaurateur, holistic therapist, and carer. My mother, Siobhan, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's when I was 40, and the last 10 years have been, I know, 10, have been some of the most formative and traumatic of my life. But it is absolutely and implicitly why I have been harnessed into writing now, captured at the keyboard, documenting memories, events, and social archive that I feel duty-bound to remember, for her and for all our sakes. It is to this end that I have been writing all I have written, submitting short stories to every competition, McManus, Merriman, Trevor, Keane, Burns, why I'm writing a play called Bridget's Women about her seven-month stay in hospital, waiting for a nursing home bed, 
why I have not one but two memoirs sitting on a memory stick, one called Mother's Day, about her, the other called Shell Bombell, about me. It is why I have created an Alzheimer's Association of Ireland page, narrating the implosion of the dynamic of a family through the ravages of a disease that is vicious and heartbreaking on a daily basis, as incrementally it steals the soul of your loved one and makes you witness. This drew followers and friends and views until they made me the voice of carers in Ireland at a special meeting in the Ashling Hotel on Parkgate Street at Christmas. And then I started performing. They started reading the blog and then I got an unpaid job as the features editor on the Slaney News and wrote four colour pieces each issue, doing my photography, getting the trained dorky to interview Edna O'Brien and hear her speak. I did the hemorrhaging humorist in the art centre at the Culture Night, Fusion Soiree, a writer's roast. I performed a one-woman show, Before I Forget, in the sky in the ground. I sat on the balcony. The next show was called Shell Shock in Riverbank on Easter, and they had to wheel out the emergency chairs. In the middle of the event management of that gig and inflating 200 balloons, I missed a load of calls from a Swedish number, which was the director of the Kultivera Centre in Tranas, Sweden, trying to offer me the Dylan Thomas residency there and begging me to confirm by email, which is where I came in. <laughs> I am applying for funding now so that as the only Irish recipient of this award, I don't disgrace myself and my hometown. A man I barely know is trying to get me a decent laptop that is not 11 years old and does not have the battery hanging out the back, the only way it will work. And also that I can safely store the war chest of ideas I have for books, plays, scripts, screenplays and radio pieces that I have not yet submitted to the producer at the digital radio company that broadcasts across the time zones and who has now been waiting for me for two and a half years. I hope you can please see your way clear to sending me a few bob and let me buy a pair of sandals and let me get my roots done so I don't look like the poor old towny relation with all the lovely Swedish people in their grey and white clothes and so I can make friends with the reclusive Agnetha from ABBA, who I am surely bound to meet, as she will surely live next door. I remain yours in Christ, Michelle.